each earlier. And that has put us in a position where we are able to bring you another game. We said we were signing out. We did wait to see what would happen. And we have got another match. Uh, Gundam Flame, who we saw earlier, is mm -hmm. taking on Marlin. So we're straight into the action. We're going to have Gundam Flame on that Tempo Mage. And Marlin with a Druid deck with Ragnaros in it. Uh, Sotl, do you happen to have the notes on what else is in that deck? Is it just a ramp deck? Uh, I can find it very quickly. Marlin's Druid is... No, it is a Yog Druid. It's just... I don't know. I mean, it's it's uh, it's dogish in nature, I would say. It lo looks like... Um... You know, Dog kind of famous for playing ramp druid lists, but mm -hmm. you know, except that the the Yog builds are better, but kind of packs in um, as much stuff to bring it as close to ramp as possible. You can now see there are Dark Arakoas in that list as well. It's double Arakoa, double War, and Ragnaros alongside Yogsaron and the you know the usual spell package. Which is interesting, right? Because most ramp druid now is more like the Isharaj type of thing that people like Hoy have been pioneering. Um, and so just a, sure. a straightforward ramp druid is an interesting lineup. Sure. So turn one Mana Worm from Gundam Flame, of course. The building block that this deck is engineered off, but the Wrath is just calmly sitting in hand here for Marlin. So no great uh, disaster for him. Just Wraths it away, and he is going to be looking to power out with that Innovate sometime very soon. But that's a big pickup for Gundam Flame here as well, because... His hand was uh, running dry already with no minions uh, until that Sorcerer's Apprentice pick up. Yeah, and I feel that's the big weakness of this uh, Tempo Mage deck personally, is that if you miss that Mana Worm on turn one or if it gets killed, you, you do run a bit light on minions. Especially minions that have stats. Like, all your guys do a job, uh, which yeah. means they're easy to get taken down if you don't get rolling with that Tempo. And with only two one drops or you know four if you play Babbling Book, Mm -hmm. then you know getting that tempo is not as easy as it used to be uh, i completely agree and it, it's why you know pretty much every game i've just been sat here advocating just just kill their stuff every turn just do what you can to kill the minions that are on the board because eventually they do just run out of minions and if those minions have not been able to just push through at least you know six to eight face damage or something like that then the, the Tempo Mage is just not in range of the outright burn plan, and it, it, it spirals out of control from there. Right, and as we see now, we just get Innovate. Usually is good use when you can play something the turn after, oddly enough. So taking the time to wait until the swipe was a thing, and then innovating into the five drop. Interesting to see Harrison. We've seen some Swamp Oozers today, but we haven't seen Harrison in a long time in any deck at all. I guess in a ramp deck, you've got a bit of time to play him. Yeah, definitely, definitely makes some sense. I think there's there's just concerns of like maybe um, Marlin is is bringing this deck as um, potentially just a, 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 a to wall out shamans, for example. So he has all the taunts to stop the aggression. He has the Harrison for the Doomhammer. Um, that would that would make a lot of sense to me. I can definitely see that being effective as long as it secures some of the early ramp. But right now, it's uh, finding itself in a, a little bit of a spot against this Tempo Mage that has managed to do what it wants to do in this kind of situation, which is get one minion to stick on the board and then leverage it with the Tempo spells. But Living Roots is going to put a stop to that. But now Marlin is kind of just always a turn behind on clearing out the minions, which means that, you know, Water Elemental into Azure Drake from here can keep him on the back foot for a little while yet. Interesting that Gundam Flame uh, rated an extra point of damage on extra on average above the 1 in 8 chance of a disaster there by using the torch first. Uh, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. Just something he chose to do was to torch and then play the missiles. If the mm -hmm. missiles had missed, uh, he would have been in a really terrible spot the one time in 8 that would happen. Well, if he plays the missiles first and they all miss, what's the recovery from that point anyway? I guess. Sure. I mean, I get you could trade the Sorcerer's Apprentice and ping, right? So, yeah. I mean, I, I guess there is more recovery doing it that way. But, yeah, I, I think overall the way he sequenced it is yeah, because pretty much going to so be correct. Bad. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, War Elemental going to come down here. Marlin passed up taking the mulch from his Raven Idol, which I definitely don't dispute whatsoever. You know, as we've just been going on about for the past couple of min uh, minutes, Tempo Mage, not a deck that you associate with high value minions that you're going to need to mulch but this water elemental in particular is a nightmare for druid to deal with right those six health points are something a like druid's working fours and twos okay four and two is six that involves two cards 
-hmm. a lot of the time. And so this is going to eat something like a swipe plus a wrath a lot of the time, or just kill off a Harrison. Yeah, he he tries to contest it here with the Harrison Jones, but I think Guardian Flame will will smell what's up here and just realize he can get a lot of value out of his War Elemental here by just maintaining it on the board, clearing out with the Fireball. And no, he looks like he's going to develop the Drake. What a god! <laughs> Arcane Blast peeled from the very top card of the deck. That is the best card he could have possibly seen right there. And that is a huge swing now because he's maintained his Fireball with the Azure Drake on the board. If Marling just goes Dark Arakoa here, which I think, I think he's entitled to rule out Fireball from his opponent's hand. Here. Yes, I agree. The way that last turn was played, it's like, well, he hasn't got Fireball. Seems obvious. I just make my 5-7. What could go wrong? And he's going to find out what could go wrong as soon as he puts it on the table. But, oh, wow. Uh, Gundam Flame, of course, just a reminder, he's the player that earlier made the Innovate Hero Power play as opposed to Innovate Power of the Wild, which brought him just so much extra value to get through to this stage. I mean... Uh, Sorry, sorry to cut you off, but is Gundam Flame just a genius? Has he convinced his opponent deliberately that there is no fireball in his hand? I think the answer to that question is no. But still, this is quite some turn of events. Like, I I said it, right? You can put your opponent on no fireball there quite happily. Yeah. And that read, that erroneous read from Marlin in this situation, has quite possibly cost him the game. Yeah, and Gundam Flame doesn't even feel the need to protect his his babbling book here with his his um, mirror images. Just happy to. It's not going to die to many things, so leave it there. Yeah. Do that next turn when the hero power is available again. If this three six ever dies, which I mean, is is a question in and of itself here, because again, that swipe wrath has been able to deal with it for the last couple of turns, but it's just seemed like there was more attractive options and. Again, like, what does Wrath Swipe actually do here? It just passes your entire turn and you're just still sat with another minion on the board. And oh, no, 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 no. Please, no. Please, no. He's asking it for is. help. Oh, that, <laughs> that doesn't look good. And this is one of those situations where if that's a disconnect and it's going to probably be ruled a regain because that's how rules work. Yeah. Uh, Gundam Flame was a long way ahead there. Yeah. Yes, he was, um, but he was not showing lethal, which means that if the rules are the same as what we have um, in our in our HCT events, then he he cannot be awarded the win. Which um, you know, I, I don't I don't disagree with. You know, as a, as a blanket rule, like you want to avoid your admins having to play God right as much as possible yeah. in, in terms of making calls like that. But you know, sometimes you just feel it, right? Sometimes you just know that, that someone was going to win. Like you, you can't empirically prove it to the point where it's actually unwinnable, but you just know. It looks like he got his turn off because the swipe is gone, as are the four and one health minions. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like we might be all right and he got the turn off. We'll have to wait and see on that. But they seem like they're playing the game of Hearthstone again now. Yeah, looks solid. And uh, this is good timing. You talked about the timing of the mirror image and uh, on the previous turn that we saw at least. And this is excellent timing because he knows he can be expecting Ragnaros Firelord to come out on this turn specifically. So just <laughs> leaving that water elemental isolated on the board would have been a, a potential nightmare for him. And he could legitimately think there isn't a fireball in hand. Hang on, we've heard this before. We have. And uh, it's there again. Yeah. Alongside probably the Blood Mage, to be honest. I don't see why not. Dark Arakoa number one was met by spell damage fireball. Dark Arakoa number two is going to get met by spell damage fireball. And that rag is just looking worse and worse and worse as each turn goes past. There's now an extra 1-1 one, one on the board as a terrible uh, target. And with Frostbolt in hand, plus the potential for Cabalist Tome to pick up more burn, uh, Gundam Flame might just be able to push over this line very quickly. Yeah, and we've been mean to this card all day, but this is the situation where Cabalist Tome really shines through. Agreed, yes. Uh, you run out of resources, deliberately run yourself out of resources, knowing you can just fill your hand back up with three more spells later yep. in a match that really needs these resources. So this is why it's here. Ooh, that's a good pickup. 
that Ancient of War is a very, very big pickup, preventing that three damage of the Water Elemental being pushed through again, which could make all the difference in this situation. Picks up the Sorcerer's Apprentice to discount the Cabalist Tome just a little bit. That is Oops. another Tome, and that is a Pirate Blast. So if we Frostbolt the face this turn, Frostbolt Ice Lance, why not? Well, how, how close are we to lethal with, um, yeah, spell damage Frostbolt Ice Lance? Are we two yeah. away to set up... Uh, yeah, four plus five, so that'll be nine. And then that gets us around any potential... It doesn't get us around Feral. Yeah, it gets us around Feral, basically. Ah, uh, sure. Yeah, I mean... I know for, it get, doesn't, but yeah. Yeah, for all, for all intents and purposes, you're probably getting there if you just Frostbolt Ice Lance your opponent in the face this turn. Yeah, you've got the spell damage, and if they Feral on Hero Power, you've got 11 from the Pyro, unless they can do some marvellous things. Yeah. And that's what we're going to see. Yeah, so it's going to have to be, you know, Feral Rage is the natural draw, and then Wild Growth into a Living Roots for the spell damage, and then gain a, an armor with the hero power as well still. It's, there's, there's a big, big yeah. ask for Marlin this turn. And anticipate your opponent has just got a Pyro Blast in the first place. Well, sure, but I mean... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, he's, he's not going to heal for a small amount, right? Like, no, but he, he might he... think 10 is safe and not mess around with the extra one for instance. That's true. That is very true, yeah. That is valid. So, yeah, he's, he knows he's got to heal. He knows he's got to do some very, very important stuff. He probably doesn't know how much. And it's going to be 1 0 to Gundam Play. I'm going to call it. Oh, I... oh flying by the seat of your pants there, Lorena. <laughs> That's two massive calls I've made this evening. Yeah. Um, that double innovate call being one of my finest. So, Wild Growth, the second coming out. Wild Growth number two. Drew the Claw does nothing. None of the cards in hand currently gain him any life. And cycling Wrath into the Feral Rage is now not good enough because he won't have the mana to gain the armor. He can't remove the spell damage from the board anymore while cycling. I'm just so waiting for his manager to run on and throw game. the white towel in here. It's like, come on, dude. You're already dead. We know it. <laughs> just, just leave yeah. the building, please. But he's playing sensibly. He doesn't know he's dead. And... You know, sometimes you have to go through these these turns where we can see it, but they can't. Lethal with the cut. No, wrong. Ah, no. boring lethal. Please, come that on. That was the best possible lethal because if he misclicks, he still wins half the time. That's true. <laughs> um, so yeah, Gundam Flame picking up the first win with again what has been one of the best performing decks, honestly, in this this uh, round of sixteen and round of eight that we've watched so far. Um, it's just Tempo Mage surprises me. This is a, a deck that I, you know, I give a lot of stick to. Um, if anyone watches my stream regularly, they'll know that I, I just don't think it's a strong deck. And I think um, a lot of Tempo Mage's wins are assigned to people playing incorrectly against the deck. But mm -hmm. I, I honestly, hand on heart, I can't say that people have been doing that. People have been trying to remove minions where they can, and they've just been stuck in the situation. Um, where they just run out of that one removal that they need at the key time and the borders just snowball. Yeah, I agree with you. The one thing, the one proviso on that is we've seen a lot of turn one mana worms today. We have. I agree. You know, and turn one mana worm makes the deck a lot better, oddly enough. Yeah. And yeah. we have seen a high percentage of those, so that does raise the percentage. But, you know, we definitely have to take the deck seriously. I mean, they're only having to play one deck that isn't in the big four. And we're seeing a lot of Hunter and a lot of Tempo Mage, and obviously that's two decks, so people rating these decks very highly. Yeah, and as we mentioned, it's Zoo that's that's generally the deck that's being dropped out for the sacrifice there as well to make room for for two of those decks outside the the Power Four. Or so um, Zoo not being favoured in the the Japanese meta, particularly Tempo Mage and Midrange Hunter being the the big winners from that, I guess. But um, yeah, interesting stuff so far. So Tempo Mage has gone down for Gundam Flame. His four remaining decks are the Dragon Warrior, his Midrange Hunter, his Yog Druid, and his Aggro Shaman. One of those decks will, of course, be banned out, which, again, we do not get given the information for, unfortunately. But uh, Gundam is going to queue up his Midrange Hunter now, Marlin sticking with the, uh, the Ramp Yog Druid. Right, and Gundam getting the best of the queue up again. He's been like this all day so far. And obviously, this is reasonably close matchup, but it's a definitely something you want to queue your hunter into. Oh yeah, these these slow, clunky decks that kind of just want to play, you know, one dude every turn. Hunter can can chew that up a lot of the time. Like 
not not quite to the extent that say old zoo could like you know double power overwhelming zoo that would just absolutely just gobble up these, yeah. these individual minions one by one but it has that that same sort of feel to it where you know they have three chunky minions on the board and then you know just one turn happens where you just play a, a big idiot and they deadly shot it and then that, that's just game over at that point like there's just no recovering from that situation and recognizing that just marlin deciding to instantly play the living roots as two one ones in general i think people do this too quickly but in this situation i'm more than happy with that yeah i agree there are matchups where so for example tempo mage as i said i will keep the living roots to kill a three two all day long i don't want to expose them to the board to get flame wakered or arcane missiles or any you know, any any combination of the above um against shaman now you really have to consider holding them back because they just play into maelstrom portal a lot of the time um, but against Hunter, they generally have a lot of potential to just get work done on the board. Right. How do you feel about double animal companion into Barnes? I feel pretty <laughs> good about it, honestly. It seems a reasonable set of things to do. Um, two of the best cards in the game, followed by one of the best cards in the game, fetching another good card in the game. Yeah. Cool. Let's see what happens. Campaign number one, Misha, the dream... Um, Huffer just a little bit fragile in the face of the two one ones on the board, and obviously Leoc just not uh, not with, missing the taunt effect to force the one ones to interact with it. So Misha is the absolute best outcome there. Mulch brings him a Frost Wolf Warlord of all things, which is going to be really good with Infested Wolf. It is, in fact, that's a good shout. So yeah, yeah, I'm sure Gundam Flame with it's just gonna. Take a little moment here, more than anything, just to convince his opponent that he has other possible plays this turn, and then go ahead and play the second Animal Companion, and yet again picks up the 4-4 Misha. Again, just the absolute best outcome. Right, and Marlin here with all of the cards he would want, and no obvious turn to do with them. Yeah, it's tough. I mean... You have to start contesting this board, but exposing your Violet Teacher, which is just one of your swingiest cards, one of your highest value cards, to, to such potential devastation on the board is is a really terrifying feat, but you cannot sit back and wait much longer. Yeah, now he's now considering, if there's an Unleash, I lose. So he's considering possibly either innovating out something to make another 1-1 one, one in Hero Powering, or just putting these two 1-1s one, into the 4-4 four, four mm -hmm. to make sure they do something. Mm -hmm. And he chooses to split the difference. Uh, this means that if he runs into the Violet Teacher, at least the Animal Companion dies. Yep, it's a combination of Unleash the Hounds mitigation, and you know there's, there's still the option of just like a clean kill command on the three five. But it means that if Unleash is the play, not only are we getting one less dog, but if the four three has to go, if the Misha has to go into the three five, then it's going to die in the process. But I mean, now there is a Violet Teacher on the board, which means you have to be a brave man to just jam a Barnes and not dedicate some of your mana to dealing with that. But, you know, what turn do you have that deals with that that actually feels nice? Right, and this um, Frostwolf Warlord, joking aside, is complicating this issue because it's a really powerful card on what looks... The uh, board that could come out of this is going to be massive. Um, <laughs> words that i never thought i'd hear spoken while casting in the year 2016 right Frost warlord is a really powerful card and yeah was six six for five is is not amazing but i'll take it yeah and i mean he may not even choose to go that route it's just one of the things that's looking okay for him right now you know you don't write off barnes lightly oh Definitely don't. you don't write off how master lightly either you sure yes. don't. Still the terror of the Violet Teacher, though. He he didn't get punished for it last turn, so that, that might make his greedy little eyes light up just a little <laughs> bit in terms of uh, leaving it to live again and taking out what seems to now be a more imposing threat in the Azure Drake. But how long can you realistically expect to get away with leaving a Violet Teacher on the board with no Unleash in the hand, no counterplay to a huge board of tokens right now, no Explosive Trap, no Unleash the Hounds, none of that stuff. Yeah, and he's just going to deal with the Violet Teacher this way. Uh, I assume, at least. Is he, though? I mean, I mean I'm assuming he's going to, but he might just not, I guess. The additional downside of hitting the Drake here instead of the Violet Teacher is that the 1-1 one -one can finish up the trade, right. whereas the Violet Teacher is a weird break point where none of the, none of, neither of the other trades trade back into it effectively. 
Um, so then and it's good is... against Wrath and Swipe for those reasons as well. Right. So. Oh, he's going to nope. hit me in the face. Nope. Face. He knows. He, did, he just has the hard read right now on the hand, right? Like, Violet Teacher came down. Yep. He, he didn't see any spells being used within Innovate immediately, so he's ruled out Innovate based on turn four. Innovate is there. We know what is missing is the spell to go with Innovate, but yep. this is from his perspective. So he's ruled out, you know, big explosive Innovate hands. On the turn, he just left a 3-5 Violet Teacher on the board and nothing bad happened to him. So he's ruled out, you know, swipes and Power of the Wilds and things like that. Um, so he's just saying, okay, I'm just I'm just not going to get punished for this. I'm just going to jam five damage to face. It's your job to hurt me for it. My only concern with that play, just, you know, even factoring in the great read, is double call of the wild in hand. I don't feel the need to jam the extra five. I think I think the punishment for being wrong or a bad top deck against me mm -hmm. is so heavy compared to just look. I'm winning this game on turn eight anyway. Um, that maybe you don't need to take that risk. But, you know, it's a great read, and he's he's shown time and again in the two matches we've seen that he knows how to set up and read a Hearthstone game for sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm inclined to agree with you. I think leaving that Dre uh, leaving the, the teacher alive for as long as he did is extremely ambitious, but he has set his stall out here to be aggressive, and he's now seen a Feral Rage get used, not for healing, but for, you know, uh, removal on the board. So... That's one of the main sources of healing of the deck gone out the window. So he might even be feeling validated right now. But he's seen in the previous game, there is Arakoa after Arakoa after Ancient of War after Ancient of War in this deck that he has to chew through. So right. his Call of the Wilds aren't even reliable damage come turn eight. That Huffer may just never be able to connect with face. So five into the face while he can. Okay, I can I can buy that for sure. And another complicated decision. This this Frostwolf Warlord is making all of his turns even more complicated. Odd though that does sound. Mm. But I feel that now is the time for Barnes. It puts two things down, allows you to probably quick shot the four four. Maybe he's trying to work out how to uh, fit in an extra hero power. Yeah, I mean it really depends on how committed he is to this line of play of just going face. I mean, having now lost the board so convincingly on the previous turn, I mean. Just some of the trades that he gave up on the previous turn mm -hmm. by choosing to go face, you know, a three-one into a four-three, for example. Um, that those exchanges have caused him to fall behind so far on the board now that I think he does just have to acknowledge the board status. Um, and I think his push is is just going to end up getting punished here, honestly. But yeah, swipe looks like it ends a lot of hopes and dreams right now. And there's probably something. Yeah, you know, that's just before you even start looking at the play. Uh, he can four-six taunt. I don't think you want Barnes to live. I think I just swipe here. Uh, Barnes oh, doesn't have to live. Yeah, four six taunt wrath trade everything. Sure. Yeah, but then you're a little bit exposed to deadly shot. But if you get your Drew the Claw deadly shot when you have two Arakoas and two wars left to come after it, are you that sad about it? Yeah, you defend your swipe and your giant, and you still have Yog as well for for later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like that's what he's going to do with the. He looks like he's not sure, and he's like making sure his time doesn't get expired while he works out what he wants to do here. Yeah, he's ju he's just you know double checking, making sure that he's attacking the one ones in the right sequencing, so he doesn't lose it to the to the death rattle from the huge toad. And then Drew the claw does come down on the board. So as I said, this play is a little bit weak to deadly shot, but when you're you're packing as many taunts as Marlin in, in his deck, you're you're probably not upset about a deadly shot coming out on just a four six bear hit. So yet again, the question, how do we get a hero power? And I think we don't. I think the plan is the Frostwolf Warlord as a 5-5 five, five plus a 2-drop. And difficult to know which 2-drop. Probably just the Toad, to be honest. Yeah, I think you just need immediate stats on the board right now. The The long-term investment of the Kindly Grandmother is probably not going to do it for you. And yeah, as you said, Call of the Wild into Call of the Wild is now the backup plan. It does pick up the Ragnaros, though. This Ragnaros exchange could be everything here. Right, if he hits the 5-5, five, five, it's probably game over. And if it hits face, you know, there's a lot of danger there as well. But hitting the 5-5 five, five would be massive. Bosh. There he goes. And you can see the reaction from Gundam Flame straight away. Rocks back in his chair just a little bit. Not happy with that outcome. He does have the double call of the wild, as we've mentioned. But Huffer number one is going to have to go into that tourn. It's not going to be connecting with that jolly green face at the top of the screen, which is where it's going to be so eager to go. 
and Gundam Flame instead is going to go with the alternate line here of getting the annoying token minions on the board to interact with Ragnaros and use his bow to clear out the taunt instead. Yeah, surprisingly patient play. Like, got, got double Call of the Wild. The temptation is to just, you know, wedge it onto the table. But he's actually going to have some things to buff with the Leoc as well, doing it this way a lot of the time. Although possibly not the way it's looking here. Mm, possibly not indeed. So... Harrison available, Swipe available. They add up nicely to uh, around about nine mana, which is coincidentally the amount of mana he has. But the the Swipe doesn't really do a great deal. The Swipe just pops open the, the Kindly Grandmother and then you're hoping for the Ragnaros to hit it. But how else are you interacting with this board in a favorable position? I mean, honestly, this is... This is pretty heads up from Gundam so, Flame. He's, he's created a board state that's really hard to navigate for Ragnaros right now. So Harrison takes off three damage immediately. Yep. So that's a good start. I don't I don't know about this swipe. I don't know either. I, I, it just... I mean, what else are you doing this turn? Just gaining one with the hero power? Arm up and take off the shield? Yeah. So if Ragnaros hits it, at least that's out of the way? Yeah. I mean, I don't hate it. Uh, uh, I guess... And I he guess... does that thing that we've all done at some point in our careers. Well, I mean, that's not necessarily wrong. He has Yogg sure. in his hand. If, sure. if he really feels like he might need to just, you know, desperation yog to try and snatch a lethal or some healing next turn, then uh, fine, that's not wrong. And he goes and he increases Five, the power six. on the board. It's 11 damage, right? It's 11 with the kill command, and it is uh, 11 with the call of the wild. <laughs> that would be a yes then. Yes would have done. Yeah. And that makes things really difficult because that one extra point means he's probably going to have to make some trades. Pfft. Trading. Wow. <laughs> we don't trade in these parts. Literally, really trading. Yeah. Come on now. Come on now. Our no. opponent goes to one every single time here. Sure. You just have to do it, right? Because you're yeah. saying, you know, kill me or clear this board and gain more armor than just from your hero power. Because you are dead to my button that kills me. Yep, sure. I'm fine. It's been a long evening. And there is the desperation, Yogg. He is going to need some miracles. That's a good start, though. Doesn't quite uh, get his positioning oh, right. Oh, where does this go? Avenging Wrath is a big deal, though. This will get very, very close to a board clear, if not fully. Down goes the Leoc. Okay. Power overwhelming not going to be helpful unless that thing gets given charge. But it's not green yet. We would already see it as green if it was given charge, I do believe. Here's the cutlery set come to help. Not good enough. A pretty good yog, but the anti-climax will be real here. Gundam Flame just presses the button, says, cute yog, bro. My button hits you in the face for two, and that's all I need. Yeah, and I've just looked at my notes, and I wrote that down as a win for Marlin like a hundred turns ago, and the game <laughs> got a bit more interesting than you, possibly I expected. You did notice that there were two copies of Call of the Wild in his hand, right? Well, I thought that card was fair. <laughs> <laughs> Mistakenly thought Call of the Wild was completely fair. Yep, and what did we talk about primarily during that matchup? It was the decision in the early game turns. Yep to push face for as much damage as he could. And in the end, every single point of damage that he dealt mattered. Yeah, got it down to just his hero power needed um, after you know, Yogg right on the edge of swinging the game around as well. Yeah. So yet again, good play there from uh, Gundam Flame. And he's had a good tournament so far. I think so too. I think he's been impressive overall. Uh, picking up a win with his mid-range hunter now on top of his tempo mage. And so just two wins left to go for him. And Marlin is the player we have not seen on stream so far. A bit of a lackluster performance for him so far. But it's honestly, more than anything, just been the way the matchups have been lining up. Yeah, for we, haven't, we haven't had much chance to sort of say what we think about his play. Because mm -hmm. things have been dictated by Gundam Flame's decks, but also Gundam Flame's play style as well. He's taken it out of Marlin's hand like that. When, you, when someone just goes face at you like that, for instance... They can only respond in one way, and that's try to stop you from killing them. Yep. So, 
Gundam Flame showing a way to take control of these games. And he's shown that he's not just like a guy who wants to hit you in the face when he made that Innovate play earlier today. He was more than happy to slow things down when he felt it was the right thing to do. So showing different aspects to a game, and that's what we came to see in this sort of tournament. So we are going to see a Dragon Mirror here from the two players. Gundam Flame on the more traditional Dragon Warrior. Marlin with the new kid on the block, the Dragon Paladin. And one thing that leaps out at me straight away is that Marlin has bookworms in his deck. And we have seen some of the players here favoring one bookworm in the uh, Dragon Warrior list. Gundam Flame is not one of those players. He is not running a bookworm. And bookworm just honestly absolutely runs Dragon Mirrors from my experience with the yeah. card so far. Because, you know, it, it snipes down Twilight Guardians. It snipes down other bookworms. Fierce Monkeys, Alex Straza's champion, the Wild Pyromancer, Outdoor Peacekeeper, like all of these targets just get absolutely nailed by Bookworm. So the fact that Marlin has access to it and Gundam Flame doesn't might actually be a big deal in this matchup if Gundam Flame isn't, a, isn't able to just jam through all the early pressure that he can and just take the game away before Bookworm can even become a factor. Right, and that's a difficult... Um... Finley he has here because normally you'd probably favor the two damage over the one but against a paladin the ability to repeatedly ping their hero power later on might be important to you as well so i think he'll take the hunter power but it's, we'll have to wait and see exactly what he does uh, when we get back to the game view i uh, also something there that as bane of all sensible dragon decks we're not counting dragon warrior as sensible in this discussion okay um he had to keep Marlin had to keep Twilight Guardian in his opening hand there, because mm -hmm. it's it's the it's the cheapest sensible dragon you can keep in your hand. It doesn't really, you know, you want to play it on turn four. It activates your other dragon, so it's a keep. But having to do that does mess your mulligans about more than you would like, and that's a problem with dragon decks in general. Yeah, and even then, you're still looking for another dragon to activate your Twilight Guardian on turn four. So you right. still haven't solved the equation even by keeping the Twilight Guardian. And as we saw earlier, it's a very controlling deck. This is the second time we've seen this deck, and we haven't seen a Murloc Paladin. That's that's also interesting to me, with Murloc Paladin seemingly on the rise in some other tournaments at the moment. Yeah, I would, I'd, I'd agree with that entirely. I would, if you you know put a gun to my head coming into this tournament, said are you going to see more Murlocs or, or Dragons in Paladin today? Then I would, I'd bet my life on the on the Murlocs, and I I would have received a bullet. <laughs> yeah, I. I'm absolutely amazed that there's more than one of these in this. So, keeping the dragon, this is the bit where it pays off. This is why you have to do it. Uh, you, you put your faith in the fact that you are going to draw into those things. And I mean, Gundam Flame can make the absolute mother of all frothing berserkers this turn. <laughs> It doesn't give him enough power to completely trade off the board, though, which is the slightly daunting part of it. But he has potentially, uh, what, four rounds of minion combat. So he'd be buffing his Frothing Berserker by eight with Frothing Berserker mm -hmm. calling Alex Strauss's champion. It's just the numbers don't line up quite perfectly to be able to sweep the board because of the Aldor on that original Alex Strauss's champion. And I like the way Marlin has done this, developing just enough stuff to try and force Gundam to overcommit to this board. Mm -hmm. uh, he has that pyro equality, which would be absolutely devastating if done correctly. And instead of just going out there and clearing up, he's actually making Gundam react and not panicking. You know, he's on 25, there's going to be healing in his deck, and he's going to have time to... If he gets just one three for one out of this pyro equality, or three for two, it should be enough to work out. And this Doomsayer could also force that issue it could this is actually a pretty awkward doomsayer i mean the thing that you would be scared of dropping a doomsayer in this situation is precisely corcoran elite which you have just seen being used so suddenly this becomes a much more difficult proposition for your opponent to answer we do see the combination of uh, ravaging ghoul alex Strauss's champion that can clear this up in gundam flames's hand which is a little bit unfortunate for marlin um, but one thing i just like to point out based on gundam's flame gundam flames play again here he is very quick to establish when he he thinks his opponent doesn't have the right answer yes we saw it in the previous game with the all the hunter attacks going to face when he was ruling out various combinations with the violet teacher and he ruled out true silver from his opponent's range based on his play last turn just dropping the uh the twilight guardian for board tension and therefore he just pushed face with the three four even though it would get punished really really hard by true silver champion 
yeah, Gundam Flame, I think the most impressive player we have seen today so far. Again, I keep on about that play early, but honestly, that, that Innovate earlier, we both missed it. It was just a truly great play, yeah, even though it was, you know, when you've seen it in action, it's like, oh, yeah, that's really obvious. But that's how right. all great things look. So the Pyro Consecration, yeah. uh, one of the most devastating things when it lines up properly. I mean, you know, Pyromancer Equality and Equality Consecration are wonderful board nukes, but it's it's really hard to push initiative while, while um, you know, activating one of those plays. But Pyromancer Consecration can, often, can so much more often be used as a tempo play in itself, where you see the situation now where he's used Pyromancer Consecration to improve his board position while clearing out his opponents. Um, and that's the kind of play that you need when you're facing down these these relentless tempo-based decks that just want to keep throwing minions at you. Yeah, and he's going to have to get some card advantage again at some point in the next few turns because the curator is going to make sure that the hate keeps coming. Mm -hmm. He does have this pyro quality, but he's going to have to use it incredibly carefully. Otherwise, it's just going to snowball out of control. Of course, as Paladin decks go further and further and deeper and deeper into their deck, they do start to have these crazy cards like Light Nord. Oh, and Tyrion. Yeah. Which I hadn't seen at the point that I said that. And so it does start to favour the Paladin more and more, especially on 22 health. But Gundam Flame has found ways to produce the goods with seemingly bad positions so far in this event. He has, yeah. And that is uh, actually... a a perfect chill more for Marlin because he doesn't have the dragon in hand. He doesn't want to have the dragon in hand right now. Mm -hmm. From from his perspective, the Drake has to go into this regardless and he would like to protect his own Pyromancer on the board. So the makeup of Marlin's hand, perfect here for just dropping that chill more. And he is starting to curve out into the real stars of the show. It is hard to imagine even a deck with as much, you know, brute force in the mid to late game as Dragon Warrior has finding a way to force through all of this. Yeah, and the shapes don't work either. Sometimes the shapes are really good. On this occasion, they just don't make any sense. Like 4-6 taking on a 6-6 six, six is yeah. his solution, and that is not usually the best solution you can come up with. But here it is. It's just awful for him. And just one fairy dragon picked up off the curator as well. He's drawn his fierce monkeys. He's drawn his Finley already. So a pretty diminished value curator there. Yeah, and that's the discussion. Like, if you jam too much stuff in your deck because that might happen, you just dilute your deck too much. So, you know, it isn't a mistake to not have many Murlocs or to not have many Beasts. You just have to live with it on the occasions this happens. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I like Tyrion here. The The possibility for, for Ragnaros Lightlord to just heal the Pyromancer for one there is, is kind of irrelevant. So Tyrion definitely looked like the superior choice if the 2-8 drops that turn and... I wouldn't be surprised to uh, see Gundam Flame scooting out of this game pretty quickly if he doesn't pick up a, uh, a timely execute here off the slam. Right, and looking like it's going to go to two games to one, Marlin will be relieved. We finally had a chance to see what Marlin can do, and he's navigated this well. He played his Doomsayer, uh, forced some overcommittals, worked out pretty nicely. So good to see him getting to show off his skills on the stream. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Gun and Flame is just going to evaluate the situation here, try and find himself a win condition, just drop a 6-6 to contest the 6-6, but he is pretty much facing down lethal at this point just from the Ashbringer alone. It's going to be incredibly difficult for him to find a win condition from this point. Right, and again, if he could see his opponent's hand, he would just concede right now. Yeah. And just going to have to go through this motion and wait for the next game, so... Yeah, I mean, Marlin's considering the options here about whether to push six to face with the Tyrion or whether to just trade the six six off the board and push five to face with the Ashbringer anyway. It's all pretty much irrelevant at this point. Just kind of going through the formalities. There's the execute, just a little bit too late. And he's just going to get rushed down here by the Ashbringer. The two swings, and even with the the taunt that he can put up in the way, that will get busted down by the Pyromancer Equality in hand. So. Things are going to get very, very sticky for Gundam Flame here very quickly. Right, and I don't think he'll be too bothered, though. I mean, being two on ahead, obviously important, but also he's just seemed calm throughout all of these matches that we have seen. And again, he's still making good plays. He's still trying to make something happen with his frothing berserker. Uh, maybe he'll top deck into a ghoul in his mind, that sort of thing. But sure. we can see that Marlin... Probably just has to heal here. Making the right play for Marlin is so difficult here because there's so many routes to victory. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't 
hate it. I, I, it's it's one of those situations where almost any play that you make wins the game, right? I mean, I'm perfectly fine just hitting face with the weapon here, and then he, you know, spending my mana however else I can, make the hero power, spend the forbidden healing to heal myself back up to full. Like, what could possibly go wrong? But another player would look at the situation and say, "Well, just trade and kill the minion. What could possibly go wrong?" And both of those situations are entirely valid. Yeah, I think my play there, for what it's worth, is to go face and then forbidden healing and let the rag heal himself full up. But he goes this route, that's fine as well. Yep, agreed. I like going face there. It's all pretty much irrelevant, though. Gundam Flow Gundam finally Flow saves us the pain that we've been going through for the last three turns and moves this match on to game four. Yeah. Good guy, Gundam Flame. So, Dragon Paladin defeating Dragon Warrior. And unless my, uh, my memory very much deceives me, that is a... 100% win rate for Dragon Paladin in streamed games in this tournament so far. Yep. Your memory does not deceive you. It won earlier in the hands of um, Zake, who I also thought played that deck really well. And mm -hmm. So Dragon Paladin, a new meta. Maybe not quite yet, but definitely interesting to see the different take going on in the Japanese meta with this Dragon Paladin. When one person brings it, you think it's a bit funky. But when right. when two people bring it, then discussions have taken place and things have been tested. Yeah. As soon as the, the second person is, is bringing it out as part of, my, of their lineup, then that's that's a pattern. That means that it's it's there, right? It's it's gurgling, at least in the underbelly around the Japanese scene, that people think that, that Dragon Paladin is potentially a competitive deck. So uh, interesting take on things. And so far, the players who brought it have, uh, have been rewarded. You know, Zake, as you said was you know your your best performing player but he was unfortunately eliminated in the first round but his dragon paladin picked up a win at the first uh first uh port of call so no disputes on his dragon paladin choice and again now uh see a player getting all the way through to the quarterfinals here with a shot at the semis and again his dragon paladin overperforming yeah and interesting to see now what's been banned it would really be helpful to know but we don't know so sorry for that guys but I want to see more of Gundam Flame, given that we've seen him once already. Earlier he was playing um, Shaman and Druid that we haven't seen. We've seen the Druid, so... Okay, we haven't seen the Druid. So Shaman and Druid weren't the banned class earlier. Can you find out what his other class is? doesn't matter. We're going to get the Shaman now. Talk uh, over. Yeah, Gundam, Gundam Flame's remaining lineup is two out of Dragon Warrior, uh, Yog Druid, and Agro Shaman. Cheers. And here is the Agro Shaman with an Agro Shaman draw. Yeah, I mean, tunnel, tunnel Trog into Pumpers. This is kind of what you want, ideally, in uh, board-contested matchups early on, so you can potentially trade your 1-3 into an opposing Tunnel Trog or a uh, Malkazar's Imp, Voidwalker, something of that ilk. But Tunnel Trog into Abusive, Tunnel Trog into Flame Tongue, not really what you're looking for against a deck that is isn't is either going to pass or wrath your Tunnel Trog, right? Because right. just you know, buff Tunnel Trog, go face. Like, sure, it feels like you're getting somewhere, but you would rather spend the first three turns developing something more solid. And it's no surprise to me at all that Gundam Flame chooses to mulligan away those other two. Mm -hmm. And obviously Marlin's hand is absolutely fantastic. He's just going to have to find out how exactly he wants to go out using all this ramp that he's drawn in his ramp deck. So I'm sure he'll be pretty well set for preparation on this one. Okay. Yeah. Picks up a swipe as well for a little bit of mid-game removal. So Coin Wild Growth here into Innovate 5 drop is the quickest way that he can get himself onto board. Mm -hmm. That does leave his his uh, four mana turn a little bit sticky, but having now drawn the swipe, I guess that is something to do on turn four a lot of the time. So no surprise to me to see him going down this line. Yeah, as I was saying earlier, anytime you can innovate and know what your next play is likely to be, I mean, it's not certain that Swipe will be good, but it's it's pretty damn likely against Agro Shaman. Four is yeah. a very key number. Uh, yeah, absolutely fine here to do this innovate play. Uh, and what he innovates into is a little bit more interesting. Uh, if he's planning to swipe the turn after, he may just choose to innovate into the Drake here. Uh, I think you almost always innovate the Druid of the Claw. It's just the question is whether you charge or whether you taunt. So if you charge, obviously you defend against the overload. Yeah, I mean, charging seems appealing here. Yeah, I like the taunt. And what, the reason for this is because the abusive sergeant wasn't played onto the board on the previous turn. Right. If there was an abusive sergeant there, then I like charging to take care of the tunnel troll because you play around lava burst. Yes. 
right? Lava Burst and the Abusive go in, and the Tunnel Shrog is still there being away at face. But with no additional source of damage on the board, you don't care about Lava Burst because the Trog still has to trade in in that world anyway. Yeah, and then your opponent's overloaded, and you're not, and everything just gets all lovely. Yep. And Gundam Flame, really not having any option here, any sensible option but to develop slightly. And this is looking good for Marlin already, I'll go as far as to say. Although, you know, with 13 points of burst in hand, saying things are looking good and are over are two totally different things. They are, but... I mean, Gundam Flame is in a real mess right now, trying to find his way onto the board here, because it's, this is a real damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. If he doesn't play the abusive, he's not developing any pressure. If he does develop the abusive, he knows that the opponent has chosen to spike their innovate turn on turn three to push out five mana's worth of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Which, as you explained in a previous series... You generally only innovate when you have a follow-up play on the next turn. Or at least you try to make that happen. Right. So what likely play is coming out here, definitely swipe is within the range. But as I said, he's also just damned if he doesn't. Because without the abusive sergeant being developed there, there's just never enough pressure to contest that Druid of the Claw. So just a rough spot for him to be in there. There just wasn't really a way out of that situation for him. Right, and here's the reason for the Harrison we're seeing is the Spirit Claws... The shaman decks are starting to run now. Yep. And I think he just has to develop these, but then the Harris will probably put him off developing them without actually having a purpose. So it'd be interesting to see if he plays them and if he just goes face for one if he does. No, I think this is a. Do you know what? If you have Harrison on top of all this stuff you have, then, then, you've won. Yeah. then yeah, good game. I probably was never supposed to win this. Uh, I think that's probably the correct decision. Picks up a second Druid of the Claw now, so. Taunt walls for days starting to come out here. He can go Dark Arakoa next turn into Druid of the Claw Hero Power or weave in something else that he picks up in the meantime. So the uh, the bomb chain of taunts is starting to come out here from Marlin and this is exactly what this deck wants to be doing against Shaman. Yep, and still on 29 health. So this burn in hand is completely irrelevant other than for clearing out these taunts that are going to start appearing. And obviously yep. when you start doing that as um, the Agro Shaman, you're running out of ways to actually win the game. And this is the beginning of the end here. That's a big deal. Is Living Roots plus Druid of the Claw better than just Dark Arakoa this turn? Because removing the spell damage takes... Or remo removing the Blood Mage Thanos takes three damage off the board between mm -hmm. the one of the Blood Mage itself and the two from the spell damage. I guess it depends how often you think they're going to have just like... They've got a one in three chance of rolling the totem anyway. Yep. And they have probably, they may have Azure Drake in their deck. Some of the decks that do this do. Mm -hmm. And so if you feel that it's definitely taking three damage off the board, then sure. But I think that's a fairly big call to make. But it looks like he's going to make it. Yep. Yep. I imagine if we're seeing Drew the Claw come down, that the Living Roots is coming down alongside it. I just don't see any reason to, to favour it over the Dark Arakoa otherwise. And of course, the, the spell damage removal from the board also just beats the lava burst here which is right kind of it means that gundam flame has to tank another four damage with his face which is not irrelevant at this position because he is going to want to push through the the damage with those weapons and, and continue using them to clear minions out of the way to allow his own minions to connect with face but he can't keep doing that much longer if he keeps swinging into these huge chunky mid-range taunts from marlin every turn right and every time he does it just takes away more of his resources like these weapons are sort of bordering on being his final resource now as well. He will have a Doomhammer here near at least one, I would imagine. Possibly two. Or a second clause. They tend to play three weapons in those decks, I feel. So he will have another chance, but every time you just eating away at these resources is not good fun. And there yep. just goes six more damage that he can't put into the face. And his, his run really rides on this one thing from below, which isn't a good place to be in against Swipe. It is not, but first off, he's going to have to get through uh, Dark Arakoa. <laughs> there are still Ancient of Wars to come in this deck. He does have another Lava Burst that can get some work done here, but again, if he wants to deal with this cleanly afterwards, that means taking some damage on his face. So this is uh, starting to get a little bit rough for, for Gundam Flame here. And this is why Yogg is so unfair in Druid. Like, you've got all these things we're saying that are positive about how the Druid's working. And if every single one of those things goes wrong, he still has Yogg just in case. Yeah. 
It's like, compl and this is a different build of Druid to most that we're used to, but it's the same in every build of Druid. It just naturally plays into Yogg with all of its early spells that you're playing. It's not like, like Tempo Mace feels a little bit forced when it plays the Yogg version. Um, when they're ramping into Yogg, some of the spells feel like, do you really need a Forgotten Torch in this deck? That sort of thing sometimes. Mm -hmm. Do you really need those double arcane missiles? Um, but when it's Druid, it's just all the spells are naturally there and the Yogi is only used as an emergency and it's like the best emergency stopper ever. And I think that's why Druid is the best deck, just because of the extra stuff on top of the really good stuff that is obvious. Oh, right on time, buddy. <laughs> the museum has already closed and Harrison Jones just saunters in late as always. So this is going to be a Nourish turn from Marlin. Picks up a Raven Idol. That is just food for Yogg right now. Feed him more. So I assume that Gundam Flame doesn't have a Bloodlust in this deck. Uh, That's a thing that could happen. Gundam Flame? Uh, a lot of people have been playing a uh, mid-range build with Bloodlust, but this is just outright aggro yeah. shaman from Gundam Flame. That's a shame for him at this point, because that would be something... That is something we may see... Um, Marlin playing around, so it may take a little bit longer to finish the game than perhaps it looks like it should mm -hmm. if we do see the game Sure uh, But it's looking like Marlin will take this down eventually as he Oh, we can see the players, they're still playing I think Yeah, I'd be surprised if this game is over just yet, there is still definitely a little bit of play left in there, there so And whatever Marlin did last turn is no longer on spectator view, so we have to reconstruct it. And it didn't take much off the board, whatever it was. Uh, well, it was a Nourish turn for a start, right? So he spent the majority of his mana that turn on Nourishing, so yep. no great surprise that he didn't address the board. Um, now with the uh, Ancient of War and the Feral Rage and the Yogg to back it all up at the end and the Harrison Jones if a Doomhammer does get drawn... It's uh, it's looking rough, although there is a rock buyer in hand for Gundam Flame. So if a Doomhammer does get drawn, it might be um, a matter of you know pairing it together with Rock Biter immediately for lethal. Yeah, this is one of the problems when you don't have like um, any sort of mid range buffs for these totems. You're only facing seven a turn, right? And that's not quite enough when you've used up your lava burst. You've used up at least one lightning bolt. You've used up your claws. And your opponents have a wall of taunts. So he's going to be hoping for something like a flame tongue. That'll help him get through the taunts as and when they arrive. Yeah. Uh, so he's been building up this board patiently to at least have that option. Uh, that is his win condition, is to somehow flame tongue through an Ancient of War and then do it again the turn after. But it is hard to see how he's going to get all this damage through. It is, and it looked like he was agonizing with the decision there at the end of his turn as to whether he wanted to fire that Lava Burst at face for six right now, and basically, I mean, basically that would be a committal to drawing Doomhammer this game if it were to happen. That is just to say I'm going to use this mana now while I have it available. That way, you know, if I start drawing things like Finley, I have more spare mana available if I if I life tap into, you know, some higher value things. If I draw Doomhammer, I'm just immediately committed to the damage. But he chose to hold on to it. And that's going to pay dividends for him here because it will allow him to keep a much greater chunk of his board alive here in dealing with this Ancient of War. Yeah, and not picking up what he wants to pick up at all here. So, is he really going to have to just run everything in and replay Feral Spirits? Yeah, he like, he, he could lava burst and you know, run in some bits and pieces, but... Yeah, again, six is an awkward number, though, right? Like, dealing the six here, and then you have three, two, and two on the board. Like, do you really want to be sending in both of those Spirit Wolves? I mean, I guess the fact that he's replacing them both straight away is is enough for Gundam Flame to say yes. But, yeah, I think he would have loved to uh, find some sort of beneficial play with the Rock Biter, or as you've been saying, a Flame Tongue Totem that turn, just to be able to bust through a little bit more quickly and push more damage to face that turn, maintain more of his original board. Right, and he's held on to that swipe for a long time. No, it doesn't do particularly exciting things, but it takes a lot of the actual power off the board if he uses it. Uh, yeah, he seems um, to be being greedy and waiting for the spell damage, obviously, to wipe it all out in one go. And I have to say I'm really surprised by that turn from uh, from Gundam Flame, choosing to develop um, much less power with just the hero power and totem there instead of the, the Feral Spirits. 
which has essentially just given a free roll turn to the druid here, just to say, all right, pressure's off for one turn, do what you like. And you give druid one free turn to themselves to do anything that they like, you're probably going to be facing down a disgusting board state the next turn. <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly what he's going to find happening. Uh, plenty of healing available as well here for druids. And uh, none of that is it, but this is going to be a, a pretty good card for next turn. He's already got the Feral, and he's comfortable that he is not going to die anytime soon. So just building yeah, his board and clearing stuff out. Right, and he also chalked up four or five spells that turn into into his Yogg-Saron you know, backup plan, if you like. Yeah. So even if things were to spiral out of control from here, which honestly, it's not that hard. You know, Maelstrom Portal is a card now. This yep. board can be dealt with quite simply from the from the Shaman player. So even if this was to go backwards, uh, the Yogg-Saron having got all that extra fuel from that turn, from the Raven Idol, from the Wild Growth, from the Wrath, etc. You know, it's 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 such a huge Yogg building up now in the hand of Marlin. Yeah, something that I've been impressed with Hearthstone in general with over the last since Whispers came out is the not comeback mechanics as such, but you know games don't die and snowball like they used to quite anywhere near as often. Like this game's been over for some time, but somehow Gundam has found a way to at least extend it into the the world of if you know if Maelstrom Portal, if Flame Tongue, etc. Yeah. Um, whereas. I know, before Whispers, that didn't seem to be a thing that happened. You'd just get your pilot to shred her down and your sludge belcher and off you go. Sure. I mean, I, I can see that. I, I I would perhaps dispute how much of an if there actually has been in this game. Sure. Especially, especially since that um, real slow play turn that we saw from Gundam Flame, which I do find a little bit bizarre. I really do feel like he ceded any and all pressure that he had that turn by essentially only developing an Argent Squire and his hero power. <laughs> you're late, and, Portal. Yeah. Yeah, we saw we saw the Harrison Jones. Nope, you're not late. late. But no, nope, right on time. Spell damage, Portal. Two mana consecrate <laughs> with a free shield bearer. That That is that is my stuff right there. Look at that for a play. Beautiful. Told you he could come back. But yeah, I mean, I mean even now... There's a yog. <laughs> yeah, there's, not only is there a yog, but I mean... There's still plenty of other stuff as well to come from the Druid. Yeah. Violet Teacher number two, Living Roots Hero Power, perfectly fine in this situation. Yogg, honestly, not the worst play in the world here either. We'll probably clear the board, we'll probably draw you some fuel. Um, but the consistent play, the solid line, considering he probably does still consider himself a long way ahead in this matchup. So no reason to run the Yogg risk here. Just takes the consistent line with the Violet Teachers. Yeah, and suddenly, even without playing the Yogg, just playing sensible Hearthstone, the board is once again diffused. Um, exciting though that was for a moment for Gundam Flame. Yeah, I'm interested because <laughs> he, he could have chosen to use the Rock Biter as well, just to get the, the full board dominance, you know, mm -hmm. send the 1 1 up into the Biter yeah. Teacher. And at this point, after your Druid opponent has Feral Raged himself back up to 26, is your Doomhammer even an out? Like, you know the deck plays Harrison, you saw it. He's already up at 26, so Doomhammer Rockbiter doesn't even really make a dent in the life total. Um, so is your Rockbiter really such a win condition that you can't use it to just completely secure the board? I'm not sure. Yeah, it did It did seem like completely securing the board just for one turn and then trying to draw something that's going to do some damage, maybe a second thing from below or something, Right. Um, was probably more likely to get damage through than... Or enough damage through, because as like you say, it's just 10 damage from the Doomhammer, so... Yeah. Uh, and now you've got to deal with these 1-1s one again. You've struggled to deal with them once already. Yeah, and Marlin recognising here that he can't clear the Flame Tongue Totem, so he's just going to isolate the Flame Tongue Totem instead, so that it's having no impact on this 510. And that is enough punishment, finally, for Gundam Flame. I mean, hats off to him. He stuck in there that game. An right. absolute trooper, but that was that was torture for the aggro shaman from from pretty much turn three or four. Yeah, in the middle, not in the middle, towards the end there on the turn where he made all the minions, Marlin emoted something. Obviously, my Japanese is not what it used to be, mm. but um, I don't know what the emote was. But I suspect that Gundam Flame thought, you know what, Gundam Flame even thought, you know what, I'm just going to make you go all the way there for that and play your extra three turns and feel this pain. <laughs> 
Sure. Okay. So Marlin has now picked up a win with that slightly unconventional uh, ramp Yog Druid, the, uh, the the wall Druid with Yog, if you like, um, and it's it's paid off for him. He squared the series up now, two games to two. So he has two out of his mid Shaman Yog Mage and Dragon Warrior remaining up against the uh, Dragon Warrior Yog Druid and Agro Shaman, or two of from Gundam Flame. Yeah, so we know that um, Flame's decks are the Dragon Warrior and the Shaman. They're the two he's lost with, so... Correct, yes. They will definitely be the two that come out. And again, we are going to have to wait and see uh, what Marlin plays, because we have now seen both of his decks win. Mm -hmm. uh, Dragon Warrior and Shaman, not bad decks to have left, though. No, it's true, but, I mean, honestly, Shaman feels like it's it's underperformed a little bit in this tournament so far. Um, Dragon Warrior has has done fine, but it's not been absolutely dominant. I mean, it, it's it's hard to really get a handle on where Dragon Warrior actually is in the tournament meta because it's been banned in like eighty five percent of games for months. Right. So you know you never actually get to see it play out. So we come here and no one seems to be banning Dragon Warrior, and it's not honestly not being that successful. It's doing fine. But it's not terrorizing the metagame in the way you'd expect for a deck that has been banned so consistently month on month. Yeah, and some this happened with um, Patron as well. Well, something that happened is people stopped practicing Patron because they never got to play it. And then every now and again, somebody would like call your bluff and make you play the deck. And if you hadn't put in a bit of the work, you could just fall apart if you weren't careful. Sure. And, you know, maybe it's a bit of Emperor's New Clothes with Dragon Warrior. It is one of the very best decks, but... You know, these guys haven't necessarily teched them excitingly. They're probably expecting it to get banned a lot. I don't just mean these guys. I mean, any tournament players are probably testing Dragon Warrior less than they're testing their other decks in the lineup. I think that's probably a fair assessment, yeah. I think there's an attitude from players towards the deck as well. It's like, you know, how much do I really need to practice Dragon right. Warrior, even if I am going to play it? Which, um, you know, there is an element to truth to. It is a yeah. very, very simplistic deck, but that kind of thinking towards any element of hearthstone is going to get you punished eventually yeah definitely it's amazing the little things you can pick up by playing a deck over and over of course when you're five decks deep you do have to just sometimes put something on the back burner because practicing five decks in the space of a month sounds like a lot of time especially for the pros who have all day to do it but it still takes an awful lot of work especially if you want high level testing against partners who also want to test their stuff Okay. All right, so coin totem golem coming out from Gundam Flame. Marlin is going to need a response here from the babbling book. Doesn't get it. So uh, let's, <laughs> let's, let's George C. what the follow-up is here from, from Gundam Flame. Wow. George C. meme again. George C. just known for after Whoa. one of his losses. Walking around saying coin totem golem. <laughs> I'm not saying anything else for the rest of the day. Well, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> of course you're not. Sort of playing the innocent guy as always, and as always, I'm the one who has to take the hit. As, mm. Talking of which, yeah. Speaking of hits, how does six to the face strike you right now? It strikes you for six. That's how it yeah. strikes me. Accurate assessment. And obviously, these two threes. Not only do they provide the taunt, but they provide six health, which is defense against stuff like missiles and such like as well. Yeah. And this could come down to that situation where the Cabalist Tome in hand is, is going to be punishing. It was there in the opening hand. Any card that is in your opening hand, you immediately have to look at that card and say, you know, is this card interrupting my curve too much by being in the deck, right? What else could this card be? You know, is it a Forgotten Torch? Is it, yeah. you know, so is it, um, you know, what else have I dropped from this deck to make room for Cabalist Tome? Because that card um, does not get played in this game. I'm calling I, that. Just... All right. All right, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you're just so scared to call anything final. In fairness, I've made enough mistakes where I've called things final and they haven't been, but I don't think that card gets played in this game. So I, I don't think it gets played to any effect in this game. I think it gets played in desperation at some point in this game. That's why I'm I'm hesitant to agree with you. Okay. Yeah. I feel like it might not. I mean, if it gets played in uh, desperation, it's going to be on turn six or seven, I think. But Yeah. That because it doesn't go to turn eight, so fireballing no, you're, you're three probably fours, right there, yeah. Another well, I mean, sign of the apocalypse. 
Yeah, he has the Arcane Blast to follow it up, takes most of the power off the board, but um, Gundam Flame found his turn there to just relinquish a little bit of pressure to now allow him to just max out on Doomhammer, and I just see no reason. You've seen a mirror image pile in the damage. You have Rock by a Lava Burst to follow this up next turn, and I think this was one bet you are going to win, Lorinda. Wow. I don't think that Cabalist Tome is hitting the board. Going to be just Dragon Warrior left if that is the case. So, can he stay alive from what we can see? First of all, can he stay alive from what he can see himself? Yes, he can. Yeah, Blood Mage, Arcane Explosion, Pin. Seems reasonable for one thing. Right. We can see that the, the damage from hand alone is 15 and he has no taunts. That makes yeah. it difficult. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. There, there is no survival mechanism here for Marlin. He is just dead from our perspective. But, yeah, from his perspective, Blood Mage, Arcane Explosion, Ping seems to be, like, the best line of play. But he will very, very quickly get the bad news that there is a Rock Biter and a Lava Burst in his future. And a second Doom Hammer, just in case we needed a spare. But that is going to be an incredibly quick game five going to Gundam Flame, which means he is now one game away from going through to our semifinals tomorrow. And I would like to see him there, Lorinda. I don't know about you, because I think he is, he's been the standout player of the players that we've seen so far. Yeah, D2 and I cast the Spring Championships, and we, we were cheering for Jacko. Obviously, we're on the fence, but we, we explained that we thought Jacko was the best player. When he got through, it was great to see it happen because we'd follow the player through as, as the best player and have it happen. And I, I agree that from what we've seen, and we haven't seen all of the four players, I don't believe, uh, Gundam Flame has been the best by... He's just been really solid, making good plays, making aggressive plays, knowing when to throttle off. And I hope he goes through. I'd like to see him again tomorrow for sure. Yeah, so and that's no is... offence to Marlin, by the way. I don't oh, think no, Marlin's no. played badly at all. It's just... Yeah, absolutely. We, it's, it's just the way it's lined up, right? We've been exposed to, um, to, to Gun and Flame a couple of times, and he's, he's impressed us in both. So, you know, we, we've developed that affinity with him over the, the, the few hours that we've spent casting him. Um, you know, Marlin has done most of his work off stream up until this point, so we haven't got the chance to, uh, to really get to know him a little bit better and, and work out you know, what kind of player he is. But the aggro shaman now has gone down for, for Gundam, and he is left, as you said, with that Dragon Warrior that he has already lost with once. So he is going to be staring at his mulligan and just willing those fiery war axes and Alex Straza's champions into his hand. Yeah, and that's definitely the way to play the deck. <laughs> just sit there and use a pure force of will to win with your mind. And against Did that... you watch uh, the Onog tournament at PAX? Some. Did you see the grand finals? Yes. So grand finals was Frozen versus Chucky, Luminosity team kill, and it came all the way down to a Dragon Warrior mirror. Yes, and it did. Frozen snap kept the curator in his opening hand. He did? And did you hear his reasoning for that? Yes, I did. <laughs> his reasoning, I don't know where you're going with this, but his reasoning was it's the person who plays Deathwing first that loses. Yeah. So where were you going with that? I'm just saying that, you know, we've we've sold the deck short of just like, oh, you know, curve out, get War Axe and Fairy Dragon and Alex Strauss as a champion in your opening hand. But we have recently seen a tournament won using this deck with a very, very, very high level mulligan decision to just keep a seven drop in your opening hand. Because so... your ten drop doesn't want to be played. Yes. So you can, exactly. for, for, you know, the way he worded it was spectacular. There were like three logical steps you had to make yourself when you listened to that interview. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you know, make sure that I I can keep my hand full on options, so I'm never forced to deathwing, and then my opponent runs out of resources first and is forced to deathwing, and then I deathwing his deathwing and I win the game. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. It, literally, what happened down to a T. Yeah, and that that's the whole thing about talking about. You're preparing decks. You don't make that snap keep unless you've run the thrill of Dragon Warrior into Dragon Warrior for many hours because you don't just suddenly decide to test out that theory in a tournament. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, hmm, I wonder what happens if I keep the curation. It's the sort of thing you do one afternoon when you suddenly think, you know what? Actually, this matchup works like this and I can force it to happen like this. I wonder if this works. Do right, I have the you... time to do this? Exactly. You grab you grab a practice partner and you, you grind out 50 games, keeping the curator every time you can, and you see how it plays out, right? It's, it's, it's just what these players do. It's the level of dedication that they have. Um, but this is Dragon Warrior up against Tempo Mage here, and 
We have talked about a lot of matchups where Fairy Dragon is just really irritating so far today. And right here again, that is just a hell of a card on turn two against Tempo Mage. Right, it's going to run in for likely nine damage, or it's just going to be a terror, like you say, doing other things. Yeah. Um, no dragon to fuel this Twilight Guardian at the moment is the only downside for Gundam Flame, but he'll have a lot of outs to do that. He will, and uh, Spellslinger going to be developed here. Gives him uh, Ancestral Healing, I believe. Yeah, the zero mana one is Ancestral Healing. So restore a minion to full health and give it Taunt. I believe if my recognition purely from images is correct. And there is a Fairy Dragon, meaning that right on time, the curve of uh, Twilight Guardian into Blackwing Corruptor is now fully active. Yeah, and nothing too exciting coming from the Spellsling on the other side either. Uh, Marlin's going to take this opportunity while his hand is full of coins and cheap things to to take his chance and see what happens really with this. Uh, there's nothing much more he can do. He's going to deliver a lot of damage. He's going to make sure he sets it up so he can do the most damage to minions possible. Four shots to kill this fairy dragon. It will be the ultimate troll if this fairy dragon just gets <laughs> to hang around on one life. And oh my god, that is that is savage. Absolutely we... savage. We might actually just seen it, see it thrown away to the gods here, though, because trading it into one of the zero twos and then Ica on the other zero two, Ravaging Ghoul and Execute, is a really, really high tempo turn here for Gundam Flame. Right, and he has the stuff to follow it up, so he's not going to be scared to throw away a card in return for the tempo here. With the Curator in hand, and also next turn being able to just shoot something down um, for three, it's... It just seems like, yeah, sure, you give it up. But as he's been doing all day, just making sure he doesn't miss anything obvious. Yeah, or I mean, less it's, obvious, it, sorry. It's not the only line of play. I mean, executing the the uh, the Flame Waker yeah. is, is, is probably a necessity. You can't let that thing just get persistent value against you time after turn. Um, he won't be accounting for the Shadow of Death in his opponent's hand if he was to just, just, say, slam a Blackwing Corruptor on the board. Um, so potential lines could get him in trouble here. And it looks like we're just going to see the uh, Blood to Ica execute here. He's going to hold back the Ravaging Ghoul. And, and he's going to play his dragon. He's going to play his dragon out of his hand, which means Blackwing Corruptor now not active. This is really interesting. So what he has available to him next turn, he's, he has his Ravaging Ghoul available plus whatever he draws, for instance, mm -hmm. if no dragon. If no dragon on turn seven, he gets one anyway from the yep. curator. Fair point. So he just felt that, you know what, I don't need no stinking dragon right now. I've got plenty of other options available to me. And actually the pressure's on Marlin to clear this lot up. It is, yeah. And, you know, the the merits of a 3-1 versus a 3-2 here, I mean, it, 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 a, it would be a little bit of a strange play just to generate a fresh 3-2 on this board that the 3-1 can trade into um, when there was already a 3-1 on the board. But since they're just specifically fairy dragons... The difference between 3-1 and 3-2 isn't really that big of a deal after you've already seen a Flame Waker play. Like, it's only really Arcane Missiles where it comes into play and, say, Arcane Explosion off of Kabbalist Tome. Some, sure. Something weird like that. So, and one Flame Waker's gone. So, yeah, very, very interesting that he chose to go that way. And we've, every interesting play we've seen him make, like, sometimes casters say the word interesting to mean, huh, we don't agree. But every time he's made an interesting play, it's gone his way and it's turned out to be really good. Right. And do look like we have a little bit more of a spectator issue, but uh, straight back into the game, no issues here. So now he has a potentially swingier, um, or not, not not swingier, but cleaner, I guess, Ravaging Ghoul turn with the three damage Fairy Dragon in and then, you know, not sacrificing his own dude as he would on the, on the previous turn, I think. Honestly, I really do feel like the level of board dominance that he got from the Ravaging Ghoul execute play on the previous turn was worth just sacrificing his Fairy Dragon. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he, he's delayed it a turn here and he's gone down a, a slower line, as you said, you know, trying to pick up some more resources with the curator on turn seven, um, which I don't disagree with, especially as we just talked at length about, you know, how we saw a player win a tournament based on playing the matchup much, much slower than most people will be used to. Right, and he even spent his time there thinking about whether to play this 2-3 Alex Strauss as champion. Uh which is great. I just love to see him considering everything. Uh, an old backgammon lesson for mine was, you know, make sure you don't make your play until you've seen three plays. And that applies so much to Hearthstone as well. 
Yeah. Um, the obvious play is often the correct play, otherwise it wouldn't be the obvious play. But more often than you think, there's something else hidden in there. Yeah, agreed. And I think the consideration there, it's like, sure, like 2-3 on the board or not a 2-3 on the board. Right. Like it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like a difficult decision, right? But the, the downside is that the, the, the information you give yes. away to your opponent, right? Like, you know, you're telling them no um no no dragons uh, no draconid crusher you're telling them no twilight guardian but since you are following up this play immediately with the curator that read goes straight out the window so that read is only valid for one turn so you don't actually mind revealing that information and the tempo he's managed to keep going is pretty impressive if you look at the hand of marlin these are cards that he just hasn't had time to put on the table and to be fair they're not particularly expensive for the large part he's no. just been forced to yeah, not keep or to, to keep those in his hand to deal with the tempo that Gundam Flame has been generating, and that is entirely down to the way Gundam Flame has chosen to play this game. Yeah, it is for sure. Um, he's going to be sat with that fairly useless ancestral healing in his hand still. I just <laughs> looked over and just spotted it down there and forgot that he'd been given it earlier. But yeah, he's going to continue to uh, tempo out pretty well here, and that Hunter Hero power is looking mighty appealing right now. If there's one thing Tempo Mage doesn't do it's heal right so gundam flame will be more than likely as always when you're trying to kill your opponent but he's going to try and kill him before turn 10 because he'll be already thinking in terms of i beat most things but yog here mm -hmm. and so he'll be just looking to try and take that out of the equation while simultaneously not letting go of this stranglehold he's put on this game and do you think we might just see him um shoot one one with his crusher and, uh, with his corruptor and the other with his weapon here just to keep everything completely under wraps the downside is Flame Strike, of course. I mean, the face race is real here, and if we've seen one thing from Gundam Flame in this set so far, is that he is a man that enjoys <laughs> going face. So, yup, Blackwing Corruptor to the face, Hero Power to the face, 2 3 to the face. This play does not surprise me at all based on what we've seen so far from Gundam Flame, and honestly, I cannot dispute its efficacy. With Hunter Hero Power, you are just clocking your opponent so hard here with this line. And as you say, no healing available for Mage except in exceptional circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, he has got the block. So in some ways, that's all the more reason to go face, I guess. But he's going to proc any block that's played pretty easily. Yeah, I mean, uh, he has the block in hand. So one, you know, Gundam Flame doesn't know that. Two, even if he wants to account for the ice block mentally, that's still three mana that Marlin has to spend not answering this board at some point to play an ice block. And Mage um, don't have the comeback potential of, say, a Rogue who just might play a 12-8 and then right. stealth it or something to give himself right. a chance. So, you know, Ice Barrier, I guess, Frost Nova, these will be the kind of things in his range that he was looking for. Picks up a Forgotten Torch, which isn't bad for taking some of the damage off the board, but not what he would have been looking for. It means he is going to take another absolute beating next turn from the core chrono elite plus the fiery war lethal? Axe, i think this is weapon. lethal three, three six, seven twelve twelve damage by my count to that is looking like gg for gundam flame who is going to book his our final spot in the semi-finals for tomorrow and honestly couldn't go to a more deserving player based on what we've watched so far he has seemed like the one player in this tournament that has the most consistent game plan that's understood how he wants to play and he has been the guy that's imposed his style of hearthstone on everyone else from what we've seen so far yeah excited to see him again tomorrow i feel that same as you i think that he's the one who's stand out from the other guys we've seen playing again that's not putting down the other guys most of them have played pretty well we've seen one or two slightly sort of unusual players i guess we could call it but I think he has been the guy who is showing that the top tier of Japanese Hearthstone is definitely in a healthy position. Yeah, I think he's I think he's played great. I mean, honestly, it's it's kind of a meme to say like his bravery in hitting face was spectacular in a lot of situations. Like that last one that we saw against the mage, you know, I don't think that was a huge leap to get there, but mm -hmm. some of the stuff we saw when he was playing Hunter, for example, just completely outclassed on the board on like turn four, and he just refused. He was just like, no, I am not engaging with this board. I am going face. And, you know, getting there by that one damage in the end, that final hero power pushing him over the line, you know, validating all the decisions. So I've yeah. been really impressed with his play so far. I'm looking forward to seeing him play more tomorrow. And personally, he's going in the book as my favorite to take the spot. 
<laughs> yep, I'm looking forward to seeing that too. And this time we are done. We hope you enjoyed that bonus game. We stayed on for you guys so we could bring it to you. So hope you enjoyed that and we will see you tomorrow for the semi-finals and the final of the Japan Championship. The qualifier is the preliminary for the APAC Championship later in the month. We'll see you tomorrow, guys. Have fun. Cheers, guys. それではここで明日の準決勝決勝戦進出を決めた4名の選手もう一度ご紹介いたしますお名前を読み上げますのでステージにおいでくださいゆとり選手ナピカ選手それではここで皆さんに簡単に今日の感想と明日の意気込みをインタビューしてみたいと思いますそれではよろしくお願いいたしますまあ今日は楽しくやりました明日も楽しくやれるように勝ちたいと思います頑張ってください失礼しますまあ今日勝つことができたのは結構びっくりなんですけどこのまま勝ち進みたいと思います頑張ってくださいまあいろいろありましたがすごく楽しかったです明日も頑張ります頑張ってください失礼します苦しい戦いが多くて結構疲れたんでまあ今日はゆっくり休んで明日に備えてまた明日も頑張りたいと思います頑張ってください失礼します皆さん明日に向けて意気込み十分ですねここで実況解説の皆さんもステージにおいでくださいはい改めましてご紹介いたします実況の芥田さんアルスさん青汁さんですそれでは予選の振り返りと4名の選手に一言お願いできますかまずは芥田さんよろしくお願いいたしますまず最初に本当に4名の方お疲れ様でございましたいや今回ですけれどもずっとあの画面の方で見させていただいたんですけれども本当にあの日頃のねこのまずここに上がってきた時のその心の持ちようから戦っている時にもう一気に目の色が変わるようなすごい真剣な表情をもう直前で見させてもらっていやなんかここにかける気持ちがすごいあるんだなというものを感じさせていただきましたですねこうもうとにかくハースゾーン楽しいなとめちゃめちゃ楽しいなというふうになんか思わせてくれるような試合をたくさん見せていただけたので、まあ、もう今日は休んでください今日はぜひぜひ休んでくださいその上でまたあの明日一緒に頑張りましょう、はい、じゃあ今日は本当にありがとうございましたそれでは、えー、アルスさんお願いいたします改めて本日は4名の選手の方々お疲れ様でした